Actually, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good that we, you hear yourself as well. <laughs> now, uh, I wanted to start. Uh, I listen to piano equation these days a lot, your solo record, right. and it's so beautiful. And it's it covers such an immense ground musically, at least for me, somehow. And but I wanted to ask you, start starting off with the solo piano, you being a how do you envision a solo record like this? How do you make it? What's in your mind when you start making a solo piano record? I mean, just... Right. Well, first of all, nobody needs to know what's in my mind. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, that's... The traffic there. But um, <laughs> solo piano is a very specific concept. And yeah. There's a lot of great pianists that are not really solo players. So you have to kind of have a concept specifically for that that you've nurtured over a long period of time. Um, you know, I I think the idea of being a solo pianist has to do with really wanting to um, generate your own universe. Yeah. So you have to really be cognizant of, of creating a whole cosmos. And... You have to think very holistically in terms of um, the instrument, your body, just everything. It's, it's, it's a whole complete thing. Yeah. You have to be thinking kind of in holistic, complete. I, I, I tend to, I, I hate to use the word systems, but um, concepts. I mean, you yeah. have to be thinking in a, in a very specific way. For instance, you know, you got to have a left hand. And some pianists have overdeveloped right hands and not left hands. Yep. Then you had to, your left hand has to be in sync with your right hand, which is a whole different thing than having a strong left hand. And, and then you had to, um, so the major thing is to really be at one with the instrument, to have a concept in your mind for solo playing that's maybe different than what you do in a trio or a quartet. Yeah then it takes relaxation and comfort with the environment being the instrument and the environment you're playing in. And, it, and then it just you have to get out of your own way and let everything flow. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. What you said. I mean, when you listen to all the tunes, like you, you cover so much ground musically. I mean, it's of course it's who you are and all your influences also blend it together but like you know you start off almost piano equation with like a romantic in brackets piece and then you go like into a monkish vibe and like vortex factor is like you mentioned the left hand goes into this amazing left handish thing and you know or you have like tone pocket the beautiful harmonic movements and uh were you ever like when you when i think of a solo guitar let's say there is like this uh Pressure is a wrong word, but like there's this solo guitar heritage. Speaking of, you know, Joe Pass and uh, I don't know so many other players, Johnny Smith or whoever, like especially solo solo guitar. Do, do you ever feel like that about the solo piano? Be uh, before you like Art Tatum and all these amazing solo pianists. Do you feel like a pressure, like well, or? I don't Pressure is the right word, but you feel the weight of that tradition. The weight, yeah, that's the word, yeah. And especially on piano, I mean, it has a whole history in classical music. Of soul. Yeah, exactly. But um, as far as, um, I mean, for instance, my, my, my Bob Powell is one of my favorite pianists, and yep. there's very few solo stuff by him. I mean, there's yeah. you know, a few tremendous cuts, but the majority of things are trio. And, um, I, you know, it's, it's funny because Art Tatum is such an archetype for solo piano, but I never, you know, I, I never feel the pressure from that because um, that just can't be duplicated. 
and yeah. there's plenty of pianists that have tried to duplicate the whole Art Tatum experience, and but it just can't. So you just move on from there. I mean, because yeah. it can't be duplicated. It just can't. <laughs> yeah. And that doesn't mean it's better than anything or, or you know, but it, whatever that was, it cannot be duplicated. So you just move on from that and try to center yourself in whatever area you're exploring and that, that yeah. alleviates the pressure. Now, I mean, in my case, being that I'm a quote, modern jazz pianist, whatever that means, I'm, you, might ask, you might ask, is there any pressure from like the Cecil Taylor solo album? For instance, yeah, yeah. Or even though it's not my idiom, like the Keith Jarrett solo stuff. And, um, you know, I, I, I guess in, in some listeners' perceptions, those things might be the state of the art. But but again, there's enough there's enough time lapse between when they were doing their stuff and yeah. me where I, I can yeah. just try to center myself in the middle of my thing and, and in a way it has nothing to do with them. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. No, it's just like when I listen to your solo playing or even do or you, you've created this original sound, which is like, you seem to, that's why I mentioned all these ideas you have on the solo record. You kind of effortlessly move between like different idioms, if you know what I mean, different vocabularies. Right. And uh, you, you mentioned classical music. How important was also classical music for you or still is? Like, well, it was very important. I mean, because I got a grounding in the instrument. Yeah. Classical music. And at the end of the day, it's just some more music. <laughs> True. You know, I mean, Debussy C was trying to do what Monk did. I mean, yeah. know, they are, both are composers whose instrument are the piano, and they create a, a universe. So, um, so from that standpoint, you know, it's just more music. But being that most pianists start with classical lessons, I did, and I was serious about it for a while. So, it's a part of my background. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what you mentioned about all the different vocabularies and stuff, um, the way I've always always approached music is that I, I've always approached music as a language and something yeah. that like, the brain generates. Um, the brain being that's the, the physical instrument through which vibration goes through us. So it's never been about studying different vocabularies. It's always been about trying to pinpoint the center in the brain or the center and vibration of, of musical syntax or of syntax. Yeah. And once you do that, if you do that, um, you're kind of, you're just let into the whole kind of flow of musical language. Yeah. And therefore, then it can naturally touch on millions of things. Like, for instance, the blues is a field of resonance. It's not a form. Yeah. The blues is a field of resonance. Once you're into the field effect you naturally um juggle different aspects of language and it's not about studying this and studying that yeah. it, it's about just tapping into the field of language and once you do that you're just by the fact that you're inside of it you're you're going to go in and out of different kind of gestural areas yeah and yeah I mean, of course, in my own, in my case, I've studied it. But I mean, of course. No, sure. I know what you mean. But I, I'm talking about an overall kind of philosophical um, thing I strive for. And it all has to do with, with the real idea of music being a language. Language. Yeah. It's like, I, I mean, that's when I teach students also. That's how I conceptualize, try to play solo even in the beginning like you're speaking because I'm making breaks right, right. and I'm saying something slower or louder or whatever and th th it's a it's a language right already in this sense I mean right yeah exactly. but uh, speaking of, of this uh, different idioms and piano players like you growing up in the 60s and 70s right. like uh, who were the these Talking about the jazz idiom, let's say the piano players that maybe you saw live as a teenager. Like, did you see like Andrew Hill, maybe or? Oh, not as a teenager, but I, I saw later. Him, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean that people came through Wilmington, Delaware, which was a really good jazz club. Yeah. 
or through Philly. I, I saw, you know, I, you know, every, I mean, start name. I mean, Kenny Barron. Oh, man, yeah. George Cables. Um, you know, there were local players, a guy named Gerald Price, who kind of, but even in Wilmington, I mean, I saw Count Basie, I saw oh, I, I, I saw every, I mean, I saw McCoy Tyner probably 15 or 20 times. Man, that's beautiful. I saw Sun Ra, I saw um, Barry Harris, you know. Oh, yeah. I, even when I was 18, I, 17, I even came up to New York and saw Cecil Taylor live for the first, yeah. How was that like for you? <laughs> To I see might, Cecil like live. I, agree. I saw him the concert he did with Max Roach at Columbia. Yeah. I, I might have been like 19 or. I, I wow. How old I was? I mean, I, when I was 17, I, I came up to New York and saw Anthony Davis. Oh man! Yeah. I saw. Um, I, I saw, you know, I saw tons of people live, as a kid. Yeah, yeah, and did did you did you already know by then that this is you know speaking of cecil or anthony davis or these piano players that this is more the direction you want to go to like this creative or I, I, like you said whatever kind of music i probably figured that out around that i wanted to go that direction around when i was 14 or 15. Hmm. but i still continue to like kind of pursue a thing as a straight ahead pianist back then oh wow, really? because i didn't know how to just jump in yeah into this so i i kind of knew the music i really loved and was was um i mean i love straight ahead cadets too but I'm, yeah sure. i i kind of knew the direction i wanted to go in but i had no idea how to just jump in and i you know i didn't know how to give myself permission yeah to start, just, just to start playing yeah or to just start improvising from I, I didn't know how to give myself permission to do that so i continued like trying to and I, when i was that age i had a style as a, as a pianist, somewhere between like McCoy Tyner and Bill Evans, <laughs> um, and you know Horton, who was a this is a very might sound really kind of strange, but as a straight ahead pianist, Horace Tapscott was actually mm -hmm. a pretty big influence. Oh <laughs> wow, really? That sounds strange, but just a couple of solos I heard him do on bass yeah. and um, kind of quasi straight up, quasi straight ahead pieces with changes. Kind of really influenced my approach a lot. Oh, wow. I'm, just, I'm just remembering that right now. Yeah, as somebody you would never name as an influence within the realm of straight ahead. Straight ahead, yes, yeah, yeah. Piano playing, but there was a couple of things he did. I don't even remember the cuts, but um, they were called or what album they were on. But I just remember kind of him, you know, really influencing me in some ways. Yeah, interesting. Well. That's so cool. I mean, the, the, you moved then to New York in the early 80s, right? Or mid 80s? 83. Yeah. And like, the, the, how, since you, you're in his house now, like, how important was, was William in this case? Like, your move, like, did you guys hook up immediately already? Or like? Yeah, I ran into him probably on the street um, within a couple of weeks when I was in town. Hmm. I introduced myself and we started talking. And uh, he, I, I, one of the, he was one of the reasons I moved here. Oh, I really? Heard, I had heard him on one of the cecil taylor albums on the hat or i don't remember yeah yeah, yeah. calling the eighth or i don't remember the title yeah. i heard him on one of them and i i heard his i could hear his distinct voice and he uh, right away hit me as a bridge between generations yeah as somebody who um could relate to the cecil taylors and the don cherries of the world and the people like that he played with but yet somebody that was a bridge to a new generation of players and i don't know how i processed but I, that's what i heard yeah from his presence on those albums definitely and, um, so when i moved here i wanted to th you know things i wanted to do was meet him and i had heard um machu that jamil moon duck group with roy campbell yeah Picard, and william and that group to me had kind of um solidified what the new school of lower east side players would sound like i knew that there was this group of people here in the lower east side that were kind of influenced by the um what i call the um breaking of the circle that happens in a cecil taylor unit and structures type of thing yeah but but they were players that were kind of taking it somewhere else i mean they were in they were indebted to cecil somewhat but had their own kind of language language and they, they were um creating on their own and i knew that they were centered here in the lower east side of new york 
And so, like, Manchu kind of, Jamil's group kind of represented that to me. Yeah. And people like Daniel Carter, who, who was not. Yeah. Jamil, but, um, sure. I, I knew that there was a school here in the Lower East Side of that sort. So that's why I moved here. And William was a, kind of the center of all that. Glued history. this together. Yeah. And, and what's so interesting about that is despite the fact that those guys, all those guys have some debt to the kind of Cecil Taylor unit structure thing. Um, Cecil actually hired them as the rhythm section. I mean, he, yeah. So when you when you consider that Rashid Bakar and Wim, you know, were was kind of hired as a, as the you, you could only, you, as apart from saying that those guys had some indebtedness to Cecil, which they did, you could also say that Cecil um, kind of enriched himself by Through them. this whole new generation. Yeah. Of, this group and, and hiring like Rashid and hiring um, Wim. So it, it's kind of a dialectic that goes both ways where there was an enrichment that happened on, you know. You definitely feel that, what you said, yeah, in the music of Cecil in the 80s once, once this happened. I mean, yeah, definitely. Like, speaking of, the, of your connection with William, was it also through William that you, you know, I have you on so many albums of David as where Right. Was it also through William that you got connected with David? Like, um, yeah. Well, I had gone to hear William. I mean, David live a couple times before I joined the group, and David got signed to Silk Heart Records, and um, he did an album with William and Mark Edwards. Passage yeah, to yeah. Passage to Music, yeah, man. That's such a good. After that, Silk Heart wanted him to do more albums, and he decided he wanted to add a piano. So he asked around. And William suggested me, and, and Reggie mm. Workman, both both William and Reggie Workman suggested me to David. So that's how. And then David contacted me, and we got together and played, and yeah. it worked out from there. So that that's yeah, that's yeah. how I got involved with that. How important was David for you? I mean, you know, I, I have great bliss, and I have so many records like Freedom Suite. I, I love that stuff, man. It's like for me, you know, David's like one of the most underrated players actually because he's amazingly immense sound and creativity but like how important was he for you musically also in your musical development okay before we we, we get into how important he was to me i would i just want to because i mean you, you keep on david has a real like cult following and under yeah and it's solid and people consider the quartet like one of the best groups since the cold train quartet yeah. Uh, yeah that type of um that, that type of, quote, rhetoric is out there about the group, but, yeah. but it, it's never crossed the surface to a more kind of mainstream acceptance for David. And David's been dead for almost 10 years now. Yeah, you know? yeah. So it's, it's about time for, like, like, the mainstream jazz world to really take David's music seriously. I agree. So I'm asking for anybody that can be of help in that, to make that process happen, that that body of work needs to get have more than a cult following of people that say that the Ware Quartet was, you know, one of the best groups. Since, I mean, it, I know what you mean. That idea needs to get out there in the mainstream, and David has the body of work. So, I, okay, I wanted to say that before. Now, as far as I, I, you know, when I joined David's group, my style. Was, was, you know, I mean, granted, I've grown a lot over the years, but the basics of my style was already in place. Yeah. And I, I did have my own um, personality as within my own music together. But I, I learned a, ma a massive, a lot, a lot of, from David about, um, I mean, it was kind of like a match made in heaven. I mean, that we were meant for each other. Yeah. And I really loved orchestrating his ideas at the piano and, um, I learned a lot from it. I mean, I'm, you know, I learned a massive amount from working with David. Um, again, my own group concepts were kind of in place already. Yeah. They were definitely enriched by going through the process of working with David. And um, it, it was um, career wise, it was extremely important for me. I mean, that's how I got a name. Career wise, yeah. as far as the actual music development. Um, his vocabulary is a little different than mine as a composer, but it mm -hmm. gave me another prism to see my own work. So, I mean, it was, and I took David's music very seriously. I was really dedicated to his music and being in the group. And um, 
I learned him. Yeah, I learned a massive amount because he he approaches things a, a little differently than I do in my own group. But mm -hmm. working with David gave me a way to step away from myself a little bit. I um, really concentrate on how to enhance his group concepts. Yeah. And of course, there's going to be a feedback loop where that um enriches your own concept. Yeah. What well, what was the process of work in that quartet like? Usually, like it, it differs, I guess, from album to album or through through year to year. But how do you see how how was the, the you know how how did the music happen? Like basically the pro, the well, progress. He likes, he's like Cecil. He likes to rehearse a lot. Ah, really? Yeah. So especially early oh. on in the group, there were massive rehearsals for albums. Really? Yeah. Man. And, um, you know he he brings in his lines, just starts playing. We fish around till we can orchestrate a part. He never told David. I mean, David never told William and I what to do because he really yeah. kind of trusted our instincts. He was very hard on the drummers, though. Ah, oh, shit. <laughs> I mean, there were certain pieces where he wanted something very specific, and he would say what he wanted. But all in all, he kind of trusted William and I to come up with our own parts that that fit. Um, yeah. But there was a lot of rehearsal. I mean, there was a lot of rehearsal. That's really, I wouldn't think that, man. You because, yeah, yeah, it may, because you sound so organic, guys, together. It's just, it's like one one organism. It's really incredible, but makes sense. Yeah, that's what mm -hmm. I. To me, the innovation of that rhythm section was yeah. kind of four, di four, four dimensional type of sound, where you could have all these things going against each other, but they yeah. work together as one organism. And I, I, I think that rhythm section created a sound that's unlike anything I've heard. That's my opinion. I'm, you know, I'm not. No, I agree. Yeah. I was a part of it, but that's my opinion of the sound that that rhythm section created. And yeah. it sounds unlike anything else in like a Cecil Taylor ensemble or any other um, kind of quote jazz avant garde ensemble. And when I was in that band, I mean, I was very. Um, <laughs> you talk about pressure. The original band I joined was. William, Mark Edwards, and um, David, and they're all alumni of the Cecil Taylor band. So yeah. I was very cognizant of making sure that, you know, there was no comparison between me and Cecil, that everything, yeah. I, everything I did was so, I don't want to say at odds, but so diametrically opposed to the whole Cecil Taylor approach because I was yeah. in a band with all Cecil Taylor alumni playing piano in an idiom where critics want to always say, if, you, if you're an avant-garde jazz pianist, they, they want to compare you to Cecil. And when you're playing with all Cecil Taylor alumni, you know, you're really in the kind of the belly of the beast. So yeah. in those early years in the Ware Quartet, I was very cognizant of, of creating an approach that was diametrically opposed to like any way a Cecil Taylor ensemble works or might sound too. Down, you know. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, uh, it's what you said. Like you guys as a rhythm section, it sounds. It's funny because when I listen to the, that music, it sounds to me, it's modern or avant-garde, whatever we want to call it. But it sounds so approachable. Also, well, it's is, uh, very melodic in a sense. Also, David's uh, um, he's a communicator. Yeah, uh, that's because that's the um, when you say approachable or. Maybe to me, I don't know. But. Oh, no, no, but that, that's not because there's any concessions. That's because he's a, Dave is a communicator. And he, yeah. he, he speaks a language and he speaks it fluently and he believes in it. And the, amount, the, the communication comes when the artist on a deep level believes what they're saying. Yeah. They, if they have their faith in their language and they really believe in their message, it's going to be approachable in some levels that doesn't mean that they're making concessions to a easily digestible sound that already exists out there it means that they deeply believe their message yeah and they can get that across to the listener yeah and i was you know i'm blessed to be in a group with um veterans at the time i mean i was young at the time but veterans like david and william yeah who had a whole history of a deep commitment to, to the language their language had their had their language had a deep commitment to it, and had a deep belief in it. Yeah, and the, the belief is what comes through, and that's on a deep level when you really um, 
when you really have something to say and you know you have something to say and it's not with arrogance it's just that you know you were put here on the earth to say this and you yeah say, you know so yeah. there's a lot of, there's a lot of power and there's a lot of beauty in that and that's where the accessibility of it comes through the deep communication skill, skills that that yeah. entails it's beautiful. Yeah, it's like this spirit. You, you know, uh, I've done these talks with so many musicians, and many of them saw the Coltrane Quartet or whatever Coltrane bands, and they said like when you were listening to the music, it was all about the spirit. Right, right. And this is what you hear, and I hear when I, you listen to David's Quartet. It was just, just like this spirit, whatever, wherever you guys went. Right. Well, we were we were on a mission. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, that's how you put it. It, it was very so beautiful. Or, you know, David was definitely on a mission. So, yeah, you know, he was a very focused artist. I mean, that's, you know, a very idiosyncratic human being and a very focused artist. And, um, yeah. and it was good for me to play with somebody like that. I mean, I, I have those traits myself. I mean, I'm focused and I am a weirdo. I mean, idiosyncratic, <laughs> but, um, you know, it was, it was, David gave me, not that I needed permission and not that I wouldn't have found it myself, but there's nothing wrong with having an added push. Yeah, sure. And David kind of gave me the added push to kind of realize it's, it's okay to be idiosyncratic. It's okay to want to do it your way. It's okay, yeah. you know, all, all of that, you know, that. I was headed that way. I mean, I was already kind of there. Yeah. The yeah, added push um, does not hurt. Yeah. Yeah. D -d did he encourage you or, or William also, all the people you played with? I know you did that duo album with Rob Brown, Sonic Explorations, kind of your first Colette album. But like, did David and all, ex uh, like, uh, you know, suggest you also to pursue more career as a solo artist or like, or. Suggested it, but not he, suggested, but like as an influence, you know. Supportive, yeah. Yeah, supportive, yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. I mean, he was always asking me, like when, when Circular Temple, my first trio, yeah. I was for a copy of it. And then <laughs> Prism was my next one, and then he yeah. hired with Dicky from, yeah. from the drummer. Yeah. Mark Aaron, he hired it because of he heard him in my trio. The record, oh beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, he was always supportive of of those things. Yeah. 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 At, at the same time, you you also. You know, talking about amazing creative minds, you also started working with Roscoe Mitchell a little, right? Yeah. And I want, you know, Roscoe for me, like also one of those, him and Henry Treadgill and all these, you know, players, like right. immensely creative universes they created, like you said, talking about universe before. But how, how did connection with Roscoe happen and how was it like to work with him? Well, I, when I was a teenager, I really loved that album, Nonea, and, Ro, and Ro, Roscoe's solo sax work. So I always yeah. wanted to work with him. Uh, the way it happened, I, I had lunch with Billy Bang one day. And I used to hang out. I never played at one note of music with Billy. With Billy, yeah. with But I used to hang out with him a lot. He was like a little friend. And, I, you know, he I, back in those days, I was drinking a lot. <laughs> And um, Billy was out at night. Let's put it. I'll just leave <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> uh, so I used to hang out with him a lot. And um, one day at lunch, I just told him, you know, I really want to play with Roscoe Mitchell. <laughs> and he said, well, why don't you just call him? I think he'll like you a lot. Wow. I said, how do I do that? He goes, well, here, I'll give you his phone number. <laughs> so he actually gave me his phone number. I called him up. I called Roscoe up and I said, look. Um, I'm a young pianist. Billy Bang gave me your number. He thinks we would really work well together, and you're an idol of mine. I would really love to play. So he asked me to s send him some stuff, and I sent him Sonic Exploration. Yeah. And he called me right up. He said, you're hired. This worked. Man, that's beautiful. It was that simple. Well, how, how was, like, if you compare his work process? I mean, I know you, you did three or four records with him, and uh, that Nine to Get Ready and the call for Steve McCall and... And uh, yeah, exactly. And uh, how was like the work process? If you compare him to David, let's say, well, his compositional process is also different, I guess, right? How, how was it work? Right. Well, one of the things that was really important for me 
in, in, in as far as collecting experiences at a young age and, and therefore working with Roscoe is that with David, I knew I was working with the, and a lot of things are regional. So I was working with the East Coast musician with David who had an East Coast energy and an East Coast kind of way of seeing th things. With Roscoe, in a, it's more of a Midwest sensibility yeah. and a non-New York sensibility. And I knew that was different. Um, albeit that we're kind of lumped into the same category of music. It's a whole different approach. And yeah. so I wanted to get a taste of that. And I did with Roscoe. It's a whole different way of kind of putting the music together. It's a whole different flow. It's a whole different energy field. Yeah. Um, and it's just a lot different. He, again, likes a lot of rehearsals. And it's uh -oh. kind of, um, it falls a little less naturally for me like where David's vocabulary, even though it's different than my vocabulary, what I do as an company is falls very natural with David. Whereas Roscoe, I had to make some adjustments. Yeah. Kind of, you know, take to a, into account that it's kind of coming from a slightly different place because <clears throat> it's not a, a New York energy yeah. type of thing. Um, not that my own music is a New York energy school music. It, it, it kind of isn't in a way, but... <laughs> But I, I, but I understand that, and I, I work well within that, and, and Roscoe's thing is a little different. So, um, you know, I had to kind of stretch outside some of my own comfort zones to really... That's good, kind yeah. ...kind of work well with... And I, that's what I wanted. I wanted yeah. that input and that kind of change of view just to enrich my own concept somewhat. Yeah, like, it's... You, you know, you working as a collaborator with all these amazing musicians and minds, how does this translate to you being a band leader? I mean, you've done such an immense, let, let's speak about your trio, for instance. I, I listened to the Unidentifiable today and it's, man, it's it's incredible, you know, the chemistry you, you achieve with your own band now as a band leader. But h how are you feeling as a band leader, like presenting the music or even if you're improvising, than being in a side role as a collaborator or? Oh, oh, first of all, yeah, I mean, as a leader, obviously it's my universe completely and I'm, I'm in control to the level that I, I want to exert control because I don't exert control with my side men. What I, what I do is establish a vision. Yeah. And then, you know, they're hired to be themselves, but it's within the confines of the vision that I've established, but I, I'm not a control freak. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, it's so it's a lot different being a leader because I get to uh, set the premise. And yeah. my music is a lot different than Roscoe Mitchell's music or David S. Ware's music. Definitely. Yeah. But, but I did learn a massive a lot from both of them. And um, that's, that's really helped me kind of um, understand different things. Um, you know, would I have been myself? in the way I am now without them, probably, I mean, I probably would have developed and figured out what I figured out, but, but I, there's a lot I learned from both of them without a doubt. Yeah. Um, um, and even aspects of them that I kind of resist it because there's things that there's ways that they kind of run groups or things that they do that I don't want to say I disagree with, but that I don't subscribe to exactly. I mean, I do it in their groups because it's their groups and that's yeah, that. sure but there's things they do that I would do differently. So even in that way, it, where I learn a lot from um, giving myself over to their, their vision in ways that I might not do within my own music. You know, there's just an immense, a lot of things I learned from that. And a lot of it, I can't even put into words. Yeah. But um, no, I, lear I learned massive, a lot, a massive amount from both of them. Massive. Yeah. Can imagine it. Did you, you, you know, when when I listen to your records, you've done so much work, which which is beautiful and everything, whatever aspect. You, you know, I want to touch the duos a little bit later, but like if I speak about the trio or even solo records that we mentioned, uh, what does it mean for you to make an album nowadays, or is this like part of for for, for how I see or hear you? It's like making an album, it's part of a process you do. It's more like a right. thing you do where you are at a certain stage because you've done so much. Right. 
Uh, yeah, they're, they're, well, I mean, it's, every, it's all process oriented. Yeah. And the albums are kind of um, bookmarks. With yeah. The book, and the book being your overall career or your overall. Yeah, album. exactly. Um, so, but I, I mean, I, I tend to look at, I, to me, that's the case with any improvised artist. I, you know, by improvised artist, I, I, I mean, I'm Bud Power and Charlie Parker improvising artists, you know, that. That the album is just a footmark when at that period. Yeah. That day, that day that you walk in the studio, exactly. it's a bracket or a comma, or an infinity, and and it's it's um, that particular slice of space and time where the microphones get turned on. Yeah. <laughs> and you're in Jim's studio, you know that. Or whatever. Yeah. Or yeah. Whoever. So, yeah. But you know, and the music is always developing. I mean, the music's developing while you sleep at night. Yeah. Um, the music is always um, moving on in and of itself, even without you. You know, I mean, it might be your music, but it has a life of its own without you. <laughs> you yeah, know? I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, that that's that that's what the album is. Is a slice. You know. If I recorded it one second earlier, it would have been something else. Completely different, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I love that because sometimes, you you know, especially the industry dictates you, you cannot have an, four albums in a year or whatever, you know, like, it. and I don't agree with that, with this, you know, I'm more like you, this idea that you just do what you feel and you do it in a, as a process. So that's, I really relate to this idea, this... Well, also, where I mean, the kind of the world, the major label jazz world, where you know you have one album a year and it's promoted. And stuff, that's all kind of gone by the wayside. Yeah. This anymore. So yeah. now you're free again to document yourself extensively and and to have the music just the records be a catalog of of the process that you're making in your own language, uh, as opposed to you know a corporate product that comes. Yeah. Out. Yeah. Exactly. So I mean, you know, the, the um, collapse of major label jazz in some ways has been a very good thing. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I kind of, yeah, I, I really like this more honest. It's of course with from other aspects, it's not so so good in a way because you know major labels support it, but musically, I think it's really important what right, right. artists like you do, but uh, the. Matthew, I just want to touch you also for, for another question, like coming to your many duos that you did. And uh, how do you, like, when I listen, you know, to, to to the duo albums you did, like, I love that one that you did thesis with Joe Morris. I'm such a huge Joe Morris fan. And the gravitational systems with Matt, you know, and all this stuff, you, you know, you do with Darius Jones and also it's amazing. You, you seem to have, like, with every player, you play, like, this kind of chemistry or commitment going on right. m musically. And uh, I wanted to ask you, how, how do you first choose who to do a duo with? Or does, does this just happen naturally, completely? Yeah, it just happens naturally. Yeah. Yeah, based but on... We've knowing worked, people and... Knowing yeah. them, we've worked together before, you know. Or it just happens. Yeah. Like, but, but what about musically? Because let's say if we speak about Joe Morris or Darius Jones, completely different personalities musically. Right. How do you prepare for these duos well, differently or not? I mean, right, you prepare by approaching a human being as that human being. Yeah. So, I mean, the thing I love about these duos and about doing them with so many different people is that. They all have different personalities. Now, I could just go in and, and Bogart <laughs> yeah. a certain thing, and it works if it works, and it doesn't if it doesn't. But I take pride in trying to search out what makes that individual tick, yeah. and trying to pull something outside out out of myself that um, in, enlivens that environment. So it's a gift to me because it allows me. Yeah to dig deep into myself and find new aspects of myself in relating to that other human being. Yeah. If I'm really trying to do that. So um, it's a challenge because, you know, I want to find the aspects of myself that really 
kind of um, work with that other human being, and I want to um, yeah. kind of hear their essence and figure out what about me can really complement that. Um, it's funny, William actually made a joke to me the other day about me having the ability to do that yeah. as a special talent. So I mean, <laughs> maybe it is a special talent. Maybe it's something that I love doing so much that it takes on the aspect of being a talent. But it's, but, but the bottom line is that I, I approach duo as naked communication between two people. Yeah. And I'm not just going to scream at them. I'm going to actually listen to them and try to, have a conversation and yeah. that's where I, where I think um, the compatibility in, in if I can be compatible with that many I mean there's people that I probably cannot be compatible with but I think that my intuition on, on this is is at such a level that I, I end up picking and working with definitely I actually do have the um, uh, the the possibility of having a real dialogue with yeah uh, so yeah yeah that's what that is yeah i i wanted to ask you also listen to the records with evan parker you did and uh evan coming from the european improvised scene well and again when you play with evan you like you said you have this dialogue with him even though he's maybe maybe not a different musical world but like uh improvised scene but do you see like a difference or did you feel the difference once? How did you actually? I mean, two questions. Feel the difference improvisation wise when playing with Evan? And how did you start playing with Evan actually? I mean, he's one of my biggest heroes as well. So. Uh, okay. Well, I, you know, I actually don't think there's that many players on the European impro improv scene that I could really feel comfortable and mesh with. Hmm. I think Evan and John Butcher might be the two people I really could. Um, and I think there's specific reasons within their vocabularies. Yeah. I, I can. Um, let me let this. Yeah. <laughs> um, Welcome to New York. <laughs> there's always something going on. <laughs> ah, okay. That might be right outside. I don't know. I know no worries, but I hear you. So. Right. Um. Evan is very, has a very big jazz basis. I mean, despite the yeah. fact that he's a European improviser, he comes at it with a love of the American jazz aesthetic. I mean, Evan knows everything about Coltrane. He knows a yeah. lot about Dexter Gordon. You know, he really does know that, as, that aspect of the music. So, and I, I think the aspect of, kind of minimalism that he employs sometimes yeah. um, is close enough to things that I emulate or, or have been involved with that. Um, so, I mean, all that's to say that with Evan and, and John Butcher, hmm. there's, a, there's enough understanding of a jazz kind of continuum and then the aspects of what they do that are kind of um, Euro, Euro slash... Yeah, well, yeah. Whatever. I mean, it's... Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's close enough to things I think about. So I, I think there's a gray area between all that where we can really mesh our sounds. Uh, you know, I don't know if that would work with other European improvisers. I did a duo concert once with, with Bear Phillips. Oh, really? Oh, well. That was very difficult for me. I mean, because I just couldn't find, you know, I, I different yeah. find common ground while we were in the concert. Uh, I did a duo concert once with Joel Leandri, and I love Joel. I love oh, really? Him. Oh, wow. Beautiful. But, you know, again, I, I couldn't really do my thing. Different aesthetic in a way, yeah. Right. Whereas with Evan and John Butcher, I can do my thing completely. Yeah. And not only can I do my thing, but I can kind of go towards their thing, or I, there's a kind of a thing in the middle between their thing and my thing that works, yeah. that works for both of us. Yeah. So I think that's something peculiar to those two people. Like, I've never played with, say, let's say somebody who's a, a, a European energy player. Let's say, like, Peter Bertzman or. Yeah. I've yeah. never played with him, and I have no idea 
if it, if it could work. I just, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I have no idea. Yeah, yeah. Sure. And then maybe other European, more cerebral players. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I've never played... And I've never played with Magnus Dahlsen or somebody like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I have no idea. But, yeah. I, but at the same time, I have no um, kind of desire. And that's not negative. It, it's just... No, no, sure. It just doesn't feel like it was meant to be. Yeah. But Evan Parker, I had a strong desire to play with. I mean, I'm a big Evan Parker. But yeah. I mean, other than the fact that I play with him and, and, <laughs> yeah, sure. and friends with him now, before I played with him, I was always a big fan and thought um, in, he was to European improv the same way that Roscoe Mitchell is. Yeah. To America. I mean, something along the same lines. He's somebody I always Definitely. wanted to play with. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 like one of my favorite musicians. Yeah. That's so beautiful, man. History, actually. Yeah. It's so beautiful. Yeah. I love him too. Like everything he did, the electroacoustic ensemble, the solo stuff, the, you know, right. such a composer also. And yeah. Right. Beautiful, but the, the, I wanted to ask you just catch you here for for like clicking with some players or not like and freely improvising. Uh, what what what's how do you stand behind something when you play a free improvised concert and how do you decide where to go? That's that's a stupid or heavy question, maybe in a way, but like why does it sometimes click or sometimes doesn't? <laughs> You know, does it ever happen to you when you play a concert that you freely improvise and you're stuck in a way? Or how do you solve these issues, like, especially about free improvisation? Oh, well, I, I tend to play with people that I, cause I don't, I don't believe in free improv in the way that, say, Jack Wright or somebody else. I mean, I'm not trying to, well, I, I, I first, or Derek Bailey did, I, I don't really believe in free improv in that way. I, I believe in free improv. I, I, oh, I believe in improv, improv yeah. as a language done within a family that understands the language. So to me, I'm never trying to like, quote, I'm never trying to free the improv. I'm, I, I, I'm dealing in a structured situation and the structure yeah. means that the music is a communication. So if I'm talking to somebody musically, I know they speak the language. And exactly. Yeah. So if you and I get together and we can speak the language and we have something to say, something's going to happen. Yeah. So, in other words, if if I'm playing in the Ware Quartet or a William Parker Ensemble, yeah, like William Rob Brown and myself and so you know, I know we're going to have something to say to each other. So yeah. it's not really free improv in the sense that. Um, and I don't believe in really playing with people that I don't have anything in common with. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not saying that approach is wrong. I'm talking about what works for me. Sure. So in that sense, it's not really free improv. It's um, improvisation because it's not written down, but yeah, uh, it's language in the very deep African or that's not even African. It's, it, it's, it's language in the sense of what you mean by language. And I know what you mean. Yeah. I know so what you mean. I don't approach it as free improv. I mean, that doesn't really have much meaning to me. When I'm playing with William Parker or my, you know, the bassist in my trio, Mike Bissio, or whatever, my, yeah. um, I know we're going to get from A to Z. I just know it. And, yeah. and there's no fear of the bottom dropping. And I know we're going to get there. So how? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, this, this, I, this, know we, I know we will. This how is interesting to me. Like, how do you decide where to go? Like, well, or how do you stand behind something that you play? Like, you don't, you don't decide. I mean, yeah, that's the, uh, there's, um, I mean, there's, there's hidden, hidden forces in all of us. Yeah, I mean, the subconscious mind is is as deep as it gets. It goes it goes to infinity, and, and, and you know I'm not saying that you, you're you, you're a schizophrenic if you're an improviser, but other <laughs> yeah. your, no other sub entities of your unconscious subconscious I know mind mean. dictates where things go. So I guess in some sense the the artistry of this is learning how to trust 
the sub entities and getting out of the way and letting them take their course. Yeah, and trust your teammates and who you play with, of course. And that's... Well, well, they got to trust the process within themselves. Also, the yeah, got to trust the whole process within a group. Yeah, true. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, beautiful, Matthew. Thanks so much for sharing all these thoughts. Really nice. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think about this stuff all the time. <laughs> yeah, me, me too. That, that's that's why I started doing these talks in a way because you you know you sometimes l listen and or, or play music and then then I'm like, okay, I'm gonna play that. I start thinking when I'm freely improvising. Then I already know it's gone, or try to solve this situation when I'm in. Right. And then I'm you know always curious to hear like how. You, you know, what's interesting about th this whole idea is, is that as a classical pianist, you know, you're involved with fingering. Yeah. You know, yeah. Finger passages a certain way. And if, you know, you look in your books, your teachers write out fingerings for you. But when you're improvising, you can't like have fingerings beforehand because you don't know it's going to be played. Exactly. So, yeah. when, when you think about it that way, it, it, it's very interesting. I mean, um, um, yeah. You, know, you, you can even start kind of questioning if you actually articulated the idea because it, it went by so fast and you know you played something but you might not have <laughs> and, and you start thinking did, did i actually articulate the idea you know yeah and, and it is articulated language you can listen back to it on a tape and you can hear the idea but it, it, it's all kind of so abstract when it's happening in real time and um, yeah you know I guess it is very interesting. I can I can be drunk and punch somebody, and you know I punched him, and wondering if I really hit him, and then look at them and see. Shit, yeah, that that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, but it's like you know when when you read an interview, like let's say with a sports with an athlete, and many many times like a quarterback or a playmaker in basketball, they would say like it slows the field slows down. And he kind of sees and where what to do, and this is like what you said in real time in improvisation. You have to do it now. So, right. like I think the great improvisers, maybe it's. Kind of, I, I've spoken with Gerald about that, right. Cleaver. The, you know, speaking about different levels and or slowing down. Actually, the real time. You know, it sounds weird, but to know what to do, like right. in this right moment in free improvisation. I, well, yeah. I think, I mean, you got to get to the point of your trust in your own process where yeah. the, the thinking is negated. Exactly. It has to, yeah. it has to be a flow of language or yeah. you're going to get in your own way. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I don't like getting in my own way. No, me neither. <laughs> or, or in other people's way. That's even worse, man. Yeah. yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Great, Matthew. Thank you so much for sharing all these thoughts. Doctor Jazz. Doctor Jazz.